Welcome into K-State Online. I am Mason Voth, joined by Derek Young and Drew Galloway. We were all with you on Friday. We're all back on Monday. And with this Monday, we're going back into football mode. Going to talk about some bold predictions for the upcoming K-State football season. Obviously, we can tell you that we think Avery Johnson and DJ Giddens are going to be awesome. That's not the most bold statement to make uh, in this thing. We can probably go out there and tell you that it's going to be a lot of fun to see Dylan Edwards in purple. It's going to be interesting to see how the wide receivers develop because K-State has a pretty solid stable of them right now and so many other things that are going on. But we're going to give you some bolder predictions, uh, and it'll probably be up to everybody else on here to keep the person honest on if they actually think it's bold or what the issue there might be. So with all that kept in mind, uh, I'll, I'll just, before we dive into it, let yeah. you guys kind of opine on uh, some thoughts about this exercise. I would just say that even though we're, we, I think we all came prepared as well with some ideas for this, I would say these are things, even though it's called a bold prediction, that I think can happen, not necessarily that I think will happen. Yeah, it, it's a lot of can, maybe not like 100%, but it's something that like, at least for mine, like I feel pretty good about a couple of these actually happening. Yeah, I look at mine, I'm, I feel good. I feel good about uh about where mine sit. So we'll we'll see uh where it all goes. Any volunteers to lead off here? Get the party started. Yeah, I'll do it. And 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 I'll actually start off with some negativity. How about that? Oh, perfect. <laughs> oh, I think, I'm pr- DY's taking my job here. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And and this one is is probably as bad as it. I don't want to say it. I, I keep coming around to maybe this being likely as I think Kansas state could maybe will miss the big 12 championship game. Mm, okay. Well, I, you should probably just stop being a show. Yeah. If you're going to come in with that I, level of negativity. <laughs> yeah, I know. That, in, in that, my that's logic, the show guys. <laughs> yeah. My, and my logic here is that, and 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 then some of it's this jarred loose while I was recording free mall earlier this morning. Is that I fully believe, and now they could do it and just go back to back. It wouldn't shock me or probably the world. But when you look at this roster, there is a lot of uh pieces that are sexy, but also in their first year of really doing something on a substantial level. And all of those. And most of those people, guys, will be back in 2025. Yeah. So I, mm-hmm. I've said this all along, and Mason knows this, but the, as exciting as th- this team could be, this is still a program poised to do their best work in the 2025 season. Yeah, that's fair. I, I totally get that. And I I think if you realistically think about it, it's, it's probably not a bad train of thought because in any sport, it's really tough for – you to group up a bunch of people that, like you said, it's really their first go of doing this thing. It's Avery Johnson's first go as a starting quarterback. Really the only guy that's coming back that you feel like he's probably sturdy in what he's doing is DJ Giddens. But like, it's only going to be DJ Giddens second year as the main guy back there. And you might put a lot on his plate um, and we'll see how it goes. And it's also tough for a guy like that going into his third year. It's almost like, you know, contract years and in, in baseball or the, the NBA where they're like, yeah, this guy, but at the end of the year, it's a big con DJ Giddens is a 30 year player this year. Like it's big for him because the NFL could be waiting on the other side of this season. That is significant to him. Uh, so it is tough to just bank on these guys going out there and getting it done. And that's why I think you see the growing pains that go out there. Like if the Royals had won the world series in 2014, that would have been a total outlier for a team that had nobody there that had played a game of postseason baseball before and gone on to win that thing their first year in the playoffs for 29 years and doing it? No. We're seeing it in the NBA right now. The Timberwolves got up two games to none on the reigning NBA champs, and the Nuggets won back-to-back games, and now it's 2-2. Like It's just tough for a team that hasn't been there before. So I get the logic behind it, but the way that I viewed it is I just think the, the amount of talent is so overwhelming here that – it's hard not to make that be the projection for K-State season right now. But I, I, I would side with you in that I will not be surprised if K-State is not playing there for the exact reason that you mentioned. Yeah, I would probably project them there, but there's 
like a long, and you got into it, a long line of history that says a group that's trying to do it for the first time usually fails. Also a first time OC as well. And and the other thing too is 10 and 2 and 7 and 2 in the Big 12, you're going to be on the bubble of getting in to Arlington with 16 teams. Yeah, a lot, yeah, a lot or, of teams. Or, or, or you're way ahead of everyone. Like I'm not... I won't eliminate the idea that everyone just beats the crap out of each other, E2. I mean, it could be a very balanced league. Yeah, no, the, it, really anything's a possibility in this Big 12. So it, it will make it tough for K-State. The benefit they have is that you don't play Utah or Arizona as a Big 12 game this year. So really the only other, you know, I in my head, I some like other teams better, but in my head, the top four Big 12 title game contenders this season – because of what I think the peak of talent is, has been K-State, Utah, Arizona, and KU. Those have kind of been the four that I've rolled with. You only play KU out of that group, and you get them at home, which we talked about last year after the fact of that game, how it played out in Lawrence, is such a huge benefit to K-State to be getting KU in Manhattan this year after sneaking out of Lawrence with a win last season. Yeah, I guess there's probably three teams I wouldn't rule out on top of what you said, not that I think they'll get there, but I think it's within the realm of possibility. That would be UCF, just because I do think Gus Malzahn is kind of loaded up on town a little bit. Mm -hmm. Iowa State, because of all the returning production, and I, I actually like Rocco Beck. So yeah, I, no, no shade to Rocco Beck and Oklahoma State because it's Mike Gundy. Yeah, we yeah. can't, we can't, we can't doubt Gundy can't. anymore. Not, not anymore. Not after last year. Yeah. All right, uh, Drew, what's number one on your list here? Uh, number one on my list was something that I kind of hinted out last week that a receiver goes for at least 750 receiving yards, which is bold because it hasn't happened in the Chris Climate era. It hasn't happened, I believe, since uh, 2014. Lock so I'm, So I'm high on the receiving group. I think that Avery Johnson will find a special connection with somebody. And that somebody will finally get close to a thousand because I mean we, we we haven't had a receiver even get close in a long time. I don't I don't think you're wrong there, but I just I almost think that the addition of Dylan Edwards might make that difficult. That's why it's more bold now. Yeah. yeah. Well, so here here's then what I would power rank the three most likely guys to break the 750 plateau for K State in, in your eyes, Drew. Uh, probably Jace Brown, Keegan Johnson, Dante Cephas. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to really get bold and just oh, get not people really around and be bold. like, hey, they're Dylan just going to feed Dylan Edwards the ball in that spot, and he's just going to, you know, every time he touches it, zip pass for like 60 <laughs> yards or something. Uh, and, yeah, what K-State doesn't play TCU this year, so uh, unfortunately no just open lanes right there for Dylan Edwards to run through. Uh, my first one kind of goes along the same lines of Drew's in terms of it involves putting the ball in the air. But my bold prediction, number one, is that Avery Johnson throws four or less interceptions this year. Because in the game of college football, the barometer to me, like you see a lot of quarterbacks, they can get by with just only like, you know, five or right around that neighborhood of mistakes. But if you go and look at how things have gone for K-State over the last couple of years at quarterback play, Will Howard threw 10 of them last season. It's also well known that Avery Johnson did not throw one last year. The 2022 season, K-State starters only threw five interceptions. Now, Adrian Martinez played the first handful of games and only threw one. Uh, and he didn't do it until after he came back from being hurt and he threw it at the end of the game against Texas. Will Howard threw four uh, in the, the short time that he was the starter. Then you have to kind of go back and combine how it worked out. And so starters in 2021, um, I don't know how you quantify 2021 because Skylar Thompson was hurt a lot. He threw four. Uh, Will Howard threw one. And then Jaron Lewis balled out against Oklahoma State with two of them. I mean, that's probably the – when we're talking – if we talk random football players with fan at some point, Drew, Jaron Lewis down the yes. road will be the most Jaren random Lewis guy to have played real game action. Uh, and we then actually, Will Howard threw 10 in 2020 as well. Skyler threw five in 2019. So if you go back and through it, it's been a long time since the K-State starting quarterback combo has been under five. I think Avery Johnson could do it, and I think that's especially significant because he didn't throw one last year. And so 
you're still kind of just waiting. Like, when is this mistake going to happen? I think for most people, they just say to themselves, he's young, that it's going to come at some point. I don't know that it does. I think with what we saw and how he operated at quarterback last season, especially that Pop-Tarts Bowl, I think he knows how to handle the ball, take care of it. And I think he's going to have so many different options to distribute the ball to, plus his own legs. I don't know that he's going to be in many situations where he actually has to throw a questionable ball that ends up being intercepted. I can see it. Uh, just the way that he played the NC State game kind of gives you the the aura of someone that plays smart um, yeah. way beyond his years. And now you'll have a lot more opportunities this time around, obviously, because he's going to have a lot more passing attempts. But I don't, I don't think that one's completely off base and – I know Will Howard had that 2020 season, um, which was, you know, littered with a lot of circumstances that are probably unfair to quantify or judge anyone on. But aside from that, we just, in general, I mean, we've all, you guys have watched K-State for longer than I have, but I've covered them for now, what, seven seasons? I think this will be my eighth. Um, It's just never been a program that really coughs the ball up in the air a lot. Yeah, going back and looking, uh, 2017, so that would have been, what, your first year, first D.Y., year. they threw eight as a team, and that was spread out across three quarterbacks Jesse that Ertz attempted anywhere from 83 to 100 passes. Jesse Ertz threw three, Thompson threw three, and Alex Delton threw two in there. Um, and, and, and those the, two were freshmen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The season prior is probably the best example we have of it not being a real issue, and the last time – that individual position only through four. Jesse Ertz threw four in the 2016 season, and that was on 264 attempts. Joe Hubner was under 40 attempts that season, so not a big concern. Uh, real quick, Drew, do you want to guess how many interceptions K-State threw in the god-awful 2015 season? 15. I'll say probably eight or nine. It was more. It was 13. Joe Hubner threw 10 picks. Cody Cook threw three. Oh, God. Which, I mean, did two of those come in the game against Arkansas? I think two of those came against Arkansas because I remember Cody Cook was not good in the Arkansas game. He was game. not cooking. Uh, actually, he did not throw a pick in the Arkansas game, surprisingly. Uh, he It was uh, Hubner threw one. But the QBR in that game, Cody Cook 39.9, Joe Hubner zero. So <laughs> Joe Hubner's only pass in the game was picked off. So that's a pretty good – microcosm that, of what 2015 was that game started with an elijah lee pick and then went downhill from there yeah i was I, there it was, it was horrible i was in fuzzies in manhattan after watching k-state losing double overtime to west virginia to start big 12 play that day so yeah that was, was a just a that was a kick in the nuts all around really that that whole season of k-state <laughs> football and basketball was not enjoyable i no i that was the year before my freshman year at k-state i was saying to myself Goodness gracious, are they just going to suck when I'm in school? Uh, so fortunately, that wasn't the case. A lot of ups and downs while I was there. So, all right, we'll go uh, on to DY's second bold prediction. I don't think anything's been stolen from him yet, so he should have a lot of good ones still lined up. Yeah, I would say I'll, I'm going to give like combined like two of them here just because they're kind of the same and there's no real – I didn't put a real way of quantifying it. So it's Keegan Johnson – will be, I don't know, maybe I should have said most productive, but I said best. Keegan Johnson will be the best wide receiver at Kansas State's, best wide receiver season that Kansas State's had since Tyler Lockett. So that's one. And then the other one's along the, the same lines. I think Damian Eli Leo will be the best defensive tackle, nose guard, whatever you want to call it, on the roster by the end of the season. Interesting. Oh, I like it. I and I I've always said like from watching Damian Elaleo while I was at Manhattan High, like he's just a guy that finds a way to get things done on the football field. You don't want to mess with him. So I'm I'm not I'm not out on that whatsoever. I can certainly see that being a possibility. And, and I think that Keegan still just has all the potential in the world to kind of be that number one wide receiver. So I, I'm still I'm still bought in a little bit, even though I said that Jace Brown might have more than he does. I. See, I, I, I feel almost pretty confident that Keegan Johnson, now health will probably be a pretty big determining factor here and maybe look stupid, but I think Keegan, maybe that's the way I'll say it. Keegan Johnson has more receiving yards than Jace Brown. 
Hmm. We'll see. I that one I'm probably just a little skittish on given what we saw and how that played out last year. Uh, but there's also the kind of the realm where teams are probably going to view Jace Brown as the most significant threat going into the year. And so there will be more attention there. And if Keegan Johnson can kind of come through and surprise, then that that certainly opens up the avenue. So I, I won't say it doesn't happen, but that's probably that's the one so far that I'm probably the most against i don't i just don't I, i'm gonna against. have to see it for about eight games before i believe it you know give you're me the like most third res- of the season you're the most resistant to that one yes yes yeah that's probably a nice way to phrase it so all right drew what is up next for you the avery johnson we finally get the 24 touchdowns passing touchdowns in a season record broken because it keeps getting tied but avery johnson breaks it this season this season uh, that is bold He's got the weapons, but it's just the biggest issue with this team when it comes to passing of any kind is how many different guys could run the ball in for a touchdown. Or what they choose to do in yes. scoring situations. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. somebody's got to break 24 touchdowns at some point. Why not? It, why not be Avery? I, I, well, well Matt Wells did say pass to score, run to win, right? So yeah. I don't know. I think, I'm the most, this year. I think I'm the most resistant to that one. Yeah, I, I thought about doing something like that, but I, I applaud Drew for taking, you know, the bold part of this exercise and really coming through on it. I, I'm not going to say it doesn't happen either, but that just seems like a really tough one given the circumstances of this roster. I think a lot of times with the stuff we'll say, it's going to get hampered by the fact that there are so many talented runners on this team. I will say there's a caveat here that could help Drew because now there is a playoff. And if yeah, you, you get the, 12, mm. you're in a playoff, you maybe get an extra game here. And, and, yeah, then, you're, and then you play 14 or 15 games, and then you only yeah. need to get two touchdowns a game. Yeah. Definitely no. possible. That's, I guess there's a strong possibility. Uh, 24 that is not many. It really is isn't. Many. It really <laughs> is not. But you need to load load up against UT Martin, perhaps. It, get four against UT Martin, and then we'll come back to it. But I am fairly certain that uh, last year, my I, I, I did pick. Uh, I did say Will Howard was going to do it, and it just it we came up we came up one short somehow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, really, he, what he killed us is what I knew. Well, yeah, what killed us is I knew he needed to have a big game against Semo, and he only threw two touchdowns in that game. So that's I knew. All the way back in August of last year, that was going to be what held me back, and sure enough, it was. So I will. We should uh, send our choices to Mason so he can collect them, keep them bottled up, and we revisit them after the season as well. I am. I am currently typing them and keeping them saved in my notes, so we've got them there, and we will revisit them. Uh, All right, uh, number two for me. I was I was gonna give you guys my big sneaky one that I, I alluded to before we started recording, but I'll hold off till number three because I know nobody's going to touch that one. Uh, so I am going to, and I think Drew might be on this one too because he's brought it up a lot. I am going to say that DJ Giddens gets to third all time in the K State rushing records after this season. To do that, he needs roughly thirteen hundred yards, a little less than that to get past John Hubert, and it would leave him just behind Darren Sproles and Deuce Vaughn. And it would also likely get him to 3,000 career rushing yards in three seasons. But even with Dylan Edwards being involved in the equation and Avery Johnson having the ability to run, I still think DJ Giddens is that good. And I think that he's going to have that kind of opportunity still to come through. So I think he ends the season uh, as a top three rusher at K-State. No, I like that yeah. one, and, and and Dylan Edwards won't be used as only a rusher as well. And there was a few gains last year. I know he got over 1,200 yards, I believe, last year, or close to it. There was a couple of gains where he didn't do a whole lot because Trey, there was a couple of Trayshawn Ward games. So, And there might be a Dylan Edwards game on the ground. We'll see. But, uh, yeah, I don't see the addition of Dylan Edwards being eliminatory for DJ Giddens. Yeah, I, I looked it up beforehand. If, if DJ Giddens duplicates what he did last year with 1,226 yards, it would still leave him short of the number that he needs to get there. And yes, they'll use Dylan Edwards for more, but 
I think at the end of the day, Dylan Edwards is a more talented second option behind DJ Giddens than what Treshawn Ward was last year, and I really like Treshawn Ward. Also, new offensive line as a whole. It'll be That's, interesting to see how that works out, but I think DJ Giddens still gets there because I think he's just that good. I think so, the offensive line's probably the scarier part of that equation than Dylan Edwards. Yeah. Another one where the caveat of winning the Big 12, getting to the playoff, maybe winning a game also helps. Yep, that's very true. So uh, we'll guys, see. It's boosting your numbers with this extra game, perhaps. Well, I mean, some of us thought that it might be a possibility. One person here <laughs> thinks that it's not. So <laughs> I guess we'll just have to, you know, go back to the Pop Tarts Bowl for all these records to happen in DY's world. Uh, all right, so you can you gave us kind of two last time DY with players. Do you have another one you want to add to the mix here? It's like a a third. Yeah, grade. I still have a couple we haven't used. I would say when you combine rushing and receiving touchdowns, I think Dylan Edwards has the most touchdowns on the team. Ooh, I like it. That that one is bold. I I, I can see it happening too because I, I like I, I like, he can just score every time he touches the ball. He's a home run hitter. That's what I'm, I mean. I I think DJ gains a lot more yards, um, more touches and all that. I, I don't think this is taking anything away from DJ Giddens. I just think Dylan Edwards could end up with. Six, seven rushing touchdowns and five, six receiving touchdowns if it works well. I mean, I would I would tell people like kind of what you guys are saying with every time he touches it like it could be a touchdown. The way that Dylan Edwards can move and make things happen, think of how like Avery Johnson in any situation where it was like 10-yard line and in last year when he had the ball, the play was never dead and something could always happen where, oh, there he is. He's just scoring a touchdown. Like that's the kind of ability that Dylan Edwards also has, and he's he has it as a guy that's going to touch the ball in that type of situation more than Avery Johnson will uh, with and catching it he, and running it. So, and I didn't add this, but maybe I should. What if he gets one or two kicker putt return scores too? Well, somebody yeah. better do it after the failure of somebody last season. Too, so, yeah, but we'll uh, we'll see there. Oh, that's a good one. That's probably a good one to to put on the list. All right, Drew, number three for you here. Uh, number three for me is kind of like what DY did with his second one. I'm not really sure how we can quantify this, but mine is uh, that Travis Bates will be the best defensive end at K-State by the season's end. I just think that there's a lot of momentum going his way, and the defensive end room is just so loaded right now that it kind of makes it bold to just quantify like one guy as somebody who's going to be the best one, but I think that he might be the best. No, I like it. That's a good, that's a good one, a, a good place to go. And it helps us talk about that room even more. I have two things on that. One is I might go like Jordan Allen or Chidi Obi Iser if I was going to go to the bull prediction route on that. I think uh, Travis Bates could certainly be that. Uh, a lot of people like him a lot too. And two is that the the guys that we're excited about in that room are what we just talked about and I think my first point is they're all doing it for the first time. Travis Bates is doing it for the first time at the FBS level. Yeah. The three redshirt yeah. freshmen, Davis Obiizer, Jordan Allen, they haven't really done it yet. Uh Toby Osinsami hasn't really done it yet. So the, the, those are the things I so when, the, when everyone's excited about these guys, I like it and then, and I'm I can't wait to watch them. I just hope it's not a case where like there's a lot of growing pains and they're just scratching the surface of their potential because if so, then it, then people are going to be like, well, this is an underwhelming unit when in reality, they're just still developing and their potential is high, but maybe it doesn't get realized until 2025. I hope they're a little bit splashier soon, but I do have a little bit of a concern there. I think the one benefit is, is that if we come back and uh, revisit this, then We'll we'll have our eye test to contribute and be like, yep, yeah, uh, we'd we'd agree that that was the case. We don't, I yeah. guess, we don't need stats to necessarily quantify that, especially uh, defensively. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's and it's tough too, defensive end, where half the time the best defensive end in that particular spot, it's like you're doing so much that it's opening up for other guys to kind of come in and, and take stuff from you. And there's just a ton of guys in that room that is just going to depend on the opponent and the day you're having. <laughs> on if you know you're gonna get the the shine there. So uh I I'm certainly not against that one either. Uh I think it would probably be in the best interest because I think Travis Bates is going to be a solid option no matter what for K State. But I think it would be in their best interest as a team 
if it does go the way of what DY says, where it's either Jordan Allen or Chidi Obiezer, that they're the they are the top dog at defensive end, where they kind of have that breakout. Now they're in, I don't know, they're not necessarily in, in all of that much of a different position, but uh, I always bring up that prior to the 2021 season at Big 12 Media Day, sitting there talking with Wyatt, and we're, we're talking, you know, defensively, who needs to do something special for them to kind of reach a, a different level. And we had Felix was the one that was brought up, and obviously he had a breakout 2021 to set up what was a strong 2022 and defensive player of the year in the Big 12. So I think it's that kind of thing that you're looking for, that if you get one of those guys to really break through and do something significant, um, maybe that makes D.Y. change his mind about K-State not playing for the Big 12 title at the end of the season. Yeah, there you go. I would say Drew probably made the – Although I would go the other with, like I said, maybe like an OBI or, or Jordan Allen. Drew probably did make the the smarter call there just because Bates has done it at college football already, even though it was at the FCS level. And he, he does come across as someone as maybe not as high of a ceiling as those guys, but maybe a higher floor. Yeah. All right. My third one. I, I, was, I was just going to say that I was going to throw a name out there. And we could kind of deduct ourselves on what we wanted the bold prediction to be, but it is bold predictions. So I'm just going to go out there and have a really bold one for you guys. Marquis Siegel has two pick sixes in the 2024 season because oh, I love it. Now was... it would be a step in the right direction because he only had one actual interception last year, but he had about 15 what could have been interceptions. And so I think hopefully he's taken at least some, a little bit of time this offseason to learn how to actually catch a football. And he's in the right position half the time to house at one. So I'm going Marquis Siegel two pick sixes in 2024. I thought I actually when, when you came up with the it said you were just going name. I thought you might be going a different direction and the direction that I was going in, um, which I'll give next. But Marquis Siegel, I like that a lot. I would say maybe just lead the Big Twelve in interceptions. Yeah, I, I had him. Uh, I had that written down as him leading the team in interceptions. So we, we were we were all on the same page, just a little bit different. I like it though, because I mean, like you said, Marquis Siegel probably dropped three pick sixes last year. So if he catches one, I think we're we're taking a step. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like I, that's it would have been a little too far of me to say that he's going to lead the Big Twelve in interceptions because I don't know that the hands are that good. But I at least think they should probably have improved to the level that he might have two opportunities there where he can finish it off because, man, it felt like every week he was just right there on the edge of, of being able to complete something special. So uh, that's why I go Marquis Siegel, who I've kind of staked my defensive reputation to uh, over the last year now. So that is, that's, an, that's officially a, a Mason Voth guy right there that I'm watching for. So I like, I like him a lot too. So you, you, you picked a good one. All right. Any yeah, leftovers I, I, I that you guys had? Dude. I do. Now, this one revolves around a guy that I think was a lot better this past season than the one prior, and I think it went overlooked because there is, I guess, little – people aren't willing to accept anything less than almost, uh, like, uh, perfect from this position, and that's the kicker. Right, I I had something with tenant written down too. Oh, uh, I yeah. should have known that Dy had something for Chris. <laughs> oh, yeah. We we still but, haven't like, gotten the results of the DNA test to see how they're related, <laughs> but we know that somewhere down the road, uh, Derek Young and Chris Tennant have some kind of bloodline that they share. I, I should have looked up the stats too, and I'm, I'm kind of in the process of, of doing that. How many? He didn't miss actually that many kicks last year. I uh, think he missed three is, field goals and he missed uh, one extra point. He only missed four kicks the entire season. Yeah, four so, kicks the entire season out of seven. The problem, the problem was is that no. two of the misses were within 20 to 29 so, yards. Yes, I understand that. But for the most part, any school in the country, if you they you say their kicker went 11 of 14 on field goals and 56 out of 57 on extra yeah. points, be like, hey, I'll take that. But at Kansas State – I, some of it's situational too. I understand. Like I, there was a, a thread on the board, I think last week and basically blamed the Texas game on Chris Tennant when he actually made that field goal. And then they got called back because of a penalty, but he didn't miss the field goal. It was a botched snap, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a yeah. Bad snap. yeah. 
So he didn't lose that game. I think he missed an extra point that game, right? He did. Yep. Yes. So, but I don't know. All I'm saying is I think people have like a skewed view of Chris Tennant because of what happened that first year, which was pretty rough as well. And he almost lost his job, right? I get that. But last year wasn't remotely as bad as what people are trying to reco- recollect. And if you look at a lot of freshman and sophomore kickers, even those that are in the NFL, if you look at what they did their freshman and sophomore seasons, not very good, right? They're, they're, there's a lot of NFL kickers that struggled near one year two. So my bold prediction, Chris Tennant, best uh, like all Big 12 kicker this year. All right, yeah, here, I, I, I got an act written down. I've got a real quick on the fly uh, one that I want to throw out there because this has to do with the kicking game and I'll let it just sit there and you guys can figure out uh, if you, you buy it or not. K-State only attempts at the most 10 field goals this upcoming season. So they attempt 10 or less field goals on the entire year. Last year, they only attempted 14 field goals on the season. You go back any season before that, the number is much higher. I mean, I was just going through quickly to see if there was anything near that world. The Bill Snyder seasons, it, it's an insane number of field goals that are being kicked. I think, let's it's see, this game. is this is 2011. Uh, 2011, that K-State team kicked 23 field goals. The 2012 team, they kicked 23 as well. So in the two really big years of Snyder 2.0, they were just kicking field goals left and right still. Um, the last time K-State attempted – uh, less than that 14 number was actually 2010. They only attempted 11 field goals that season. So I'll, I'll say it's it's less than that 14. I'll, I'll say that. Did you say what was what was the question? Was it just uh, less? I'm just saying that they that they attempt 10 or less. It's I'll say that's on the table. That's a good bold prediction because one, the game's different. I think those numbers are drastically different because those are two areas of football where now yeah. you feel like you're you know, with the analytics and everything, teams are just – coaching staffs are just more likely to go for it. They're not going to attempt this 50-yard field goal if it's fourth and three. They're just going to go for it. So that, I think that's one of the things that comes into play. And two, like that – last year they only kicked 14 field goals because they're going for it much more on fourth down. And this one's much more explosive, so I think they should be able to get in the end zone more. So yep. that's why I think it's on the table. Yeah, your weapons are much greater right now with the guys that you trust to come through in those situations. That's also a very big part of this to where or, I would look and say, hey, you, you're going to have you know fewer opportunities there. So. If, if you were going to argue it, though, you would point to the offensive line. Yeah, that's yeah. that's also true. So, But I, I'm going, even though, you know, Chris Tennant, I expect you to be out there and expect you to do fine this year. I think they're going to try and do their best to not let him kick that many. And we've also seen Chris Kleiman's aggressiveness go up over the past couple of years. And maybe Absolutely. that has to do with the way that the game is played now because it's up all across the board. But I also just think we saw it really the switch flipped in 2022. And I think Chris Kleiman's always known that he can, he's a g- great coach and he can do things really well at this level. But I think it, at one point in 22, the switch just flipped and like he's got supreme confidence right now. I don't think he second guesses a lot of things that he does. And I think that he's built a roster over the last couple of years where he trusts the guys that he's put on this team to come through and make plays. And, you know, the kicker can make plays if you need him to. But at the end of the day, the way that you're going to win more games is by letting other guys make them. And I think he trusts that to happen. So I think K-State's in a good spot there. Yeah, the the one I, that I hadn't said yet that was on my list, we kind of hinted at it a little bit, but didn't fully say it, and I have the number uh, ready, is that K-State scores three special team touchdowns this season. I just think that they're going to be more explosive in the return game, and they've been pretty good at blocking kicks and punts in the punts. Chris Kleiman era. Yep. So they, I think that they could block one and score two. Feels like he's blocked in the Chris Kleiman era. They've blocked like multiple punts every year. Yeah, no porters on the roster this year, though. So, uh, and he yeah, can yeah, good point. It. Yeah, there you go. So, uh, I'm Des- Desmond Purnell had a touchdown on a block punt, right? So, yes, yes, he did. Uh, yeah, they've had a they've had a couple like that over the last couple of years. So, well, I, I like that one. I think that's good. It's just it's going to hinge on the return game situation if that can get corrected in any way. Uh, I, it, 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 coach, yeah. 
it, it can't get worse. Chili Davis. Well, no zero problem. touchdowns. It, it cannot get much worse than that. That is accurate. Like there, so. there was not even there wasn't even like a, a threat of a return there last was, year. And and they their coverage units were bad. <laughs> they were kicking it out of bounds. They were fair catching the kickoffs at one point. It was not a good year. It does like it, it does suck that the punt return of the Pop Tarts Bowl got called back because <laughs> that would have been just in so many different ways, for so many different reasons, an electric way to finish things <laughs> off where, you know, we kind of talked about it all year and they save they save that little streak they've been on. So and uh, and without Philip Brooks, who's been the returner for like a decade. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that pop tarts return was electric. I'm, I'm, I was, I forgot that that got called back. I would, just now, now was it I don't want to. What was it a horseshit call? I don't even remember. Uh, I it don't know that soft. it was, but it was one that's like, you know, come on, let it, let <laughs> it was it way come away on. from the play. You know, you know what's on the line. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's one that when I, I watched it back, I'm like, yeah, I guess I see why they called that, but you know, come on, no, not it, necessary there. So that guy did not know his Kansas State football history, did yeah, not know yeah. the implications of that. Penalty. You, you, you got to know the situation before you throw the flag there. Like, come on. Yeah, exactly. Come on. No, 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 your role there. I was trying to, I was, I'm still caught up on the kicking situation and everything right now. Cause it's just fascinating to me. Uh, I'm trying to figure out uh, some different things. So I'm looking through things right now. Uh, one other thing that I would say, and I don't want to disparage him too much, but how good of a, a punt returner was Philip Brooks actually? And did he just kind of get that job for all these years because he picked the right time to have some punt returns where, Early on, he had the punt return against Navy when nobody could score in the Liberty Bowl. He got two of them against an idiotic KU team, and then he got the one against Missouri basically right after the giant weather delay that took place. Those were the Philip Brooks punt return touchdowns in his career. Did he build a whole punt returning career off of those just well-timed returns? I mean the 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 K the second KU game I, is the funniest punt return touchdown I think I've ever seen in my life. Wasn't there like, <laughs> almost like four returns that game? Yeah, and the, uh, well, the yeah, because Justin Gardner had a pick six in that game, the easiest pick six you will ever see in your J life. Jail Jail Daniels' worst throw of his career by far. Yes, yes, by far. <laughs> yeah. But like, the, but it wasn't there a kick return that game. I don't. I, think I don't know so. if there was there wasn't a kick return, but I, I'm pretty sure that Brooks was close to returning a third one because they I kicked it so. to him again. Yeah. After idiotically kicking it to him with like five seconds left in the half. Yeah. Did he run that one? Was the one of the five seconds left in the half? Is that the touchdown? Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, that was that was the worst one. <laughs> like all you got to do is like go to halftime. He's like, no, I want. Les Miles is like, no, I want to see this number. He's probably 88 still at the time. I yeah, he was still that. 88. Oh my god, that Les Miles, what a guy! They should hire him back. Yeah, just for the just for the the memories. I think that'd be a, a <laughs> good time. Funny now looking back on, you know, the before basically the before Lance Leipold area KU is like as bad as it was with um, Gill Turner Gill. As bad as it was with Charlie Weiss, <laughs> as bad as it was with David Beatty, I think there was more embarrassing moments for them with with uh, Les Miles. Yeah, they oh, did somehow God. find a way for that to happen. Yeah, that's uh, that's the truth. K State KU game this year, Les Miles honorary K State captain. Mm, I like that. That'd be good. Uh, I okay. Here's where I, here's where I was doing some math because it fascinated me because. Uh, you know, I'm still thinking kickers and everything. 1998 K-State, you're thinking, man, that's that's an awesome team. They did all these great things. They absolutely did. They scored a lot of touchdowns that season. Like that, I'm not trying to, you know, get that wiped away. They still kicked 31 field goals that season. Uh, they only punted the ball 31 times, though. So because you can't track, like, fumble recoveries and everything, uh, K-State had either – depending on how you want to look at it, roughly 72% of their possessions either ended with a touchdown or at least attempting to score with a field goal because they obviously missed some field goals there. 
but I, that seems like a pretty high and impressive number, right? That, you know, 72% of your possessions either ended with a score or a legitimate scoring opportunity. I'm not sure which one is like more insane to hear the 31 attempted field goals or 31 <laughs> total punts <laughs> like that. That's a yeah. lot of field goals and that's not very many punts. Yeah. I mean, they, they played 13 games that year and uh, attempted only 31 punts. So that is 2.4 punts per game, which some people might think to themselves, man, that's that's more punts per game than I would have expected them to even have. Uh, so that probably tells you just how good the combination of defense and offense was that they had the ball that many times to be able to cram everything in. All right, a little bit of a sidetrack there. Uh, any other bold predictions that we didn't get to that you guys want to toss out as honorable mentions? Yeah, did anything get jarred loose? I, I'm probably on the tangents that we went down. It's probably what got jarred loose. Not really anything else coming to mind. How about a little bit? We'll just – I know we didn't prepare for this at all. But what about Big 12 wide? Is there anything you, you kind of are, you know, ready to pound your fist on the table for that maybe is not as popular publicly yet or at all? Mm. I want to. I who do I want to say just sucks really bad this coming season that people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, on. yeah. We'll go like bull prediction. A team that's going to be. We all have to take different ones, so you can pick and pick the order. <laughs> a team that you think is going to be a lot better than everyone. A team you think is going to be a lot worse than what everyone else thinks. Okay. Yeah, I I, I like that one. Uh, let me. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna. Get it just written down real quick so I have it ready to go. Okay. Uh, I think my team that's worse than everybody, and I know that, hey, I know I know we're all trying not to disparage Rocco Beck. I don't want, you know, kicker that misses game-tying kicks with 30 seconds left to be in my mentions and all this stuff. Uh, respect to Rocco Beck, but I do not respect his head coach or the rest of his teammates at large. Uh, I just don't – I think the Iowa State love is – is getting to be too much already and it's only May. And I don't even know that it's that much love. Like I think it's people going, Hey, watch out. Iowa state might win seven or eight games this year. I think that they winning seven games is their peak this coming season. I just, I don't think, I mean, it's historically that's a fact, but I just don't think this year, like, I mean, yes, you return a bunch of guys, but if the guys you return aren't all that special, um, then I'm not going to fully buy in because also one of the things that you're banking on in terms of guys returning and how it ends up working out is Abu Sama, who K-State fans are like, well, but he's really good. Uh, this will suck to hear if you're a K-State fan. Abu Sama only had like two good games last season. It was against K-State and BYU. Outside of that, Abu Sama was just, you know, pretty – pretty average he had a couple of good games against tcu and ou but the number of carries weren't that high uh so it'll all it'll be all about volume he'll be a sophomore so a year older and everything but like it's not like he lit the world on fire last season so iowa state's my team that i think is worse than everybody is uh at least hyping up to be that's fair what i would say what and you kind of got into it i was like i don't know who's hyping them up <laughs> well I, you guys have to remember that uh I, I do frequently talk with Alec Bussey, who I I feel bad for him because he's been brainwashed by those people up there. Uh, to He's far too positive. He says too many good things about Iowa State on a daily basis to me. I will keep people in, though. He doesn't say him about Matt Campbell necessarily. Uh, he, he does every once in a while uh, send a text like, I just don't know why he would say something like this. Uh, so... Uh, he's not high on Matt Campbell, but he does talk about them. And then I saw another tweet uh, today that was talking about like returning production. Uh, and it was like the 10, 12 podcast thing or whatever. And they're like, okay, oh, state's actually, I think it's underrated how, how many guys they've lost, blah, blah, blah. And Iowa state is being slept on. Nobody's sleeping on Iowa state. They're just going to roll out there and get their seven wins and call it good. They're not, they're not going to be anything special because when, you return just a bunch of average players, then you're going to get average results, which is fine. It's better than returning bad players and getting bad results or losing good players and having bad players come in. But I just, I don't get the Iowa state love. I will say that like their non-con is not very good. So it, it, they could 
get eight, nine wins, maybe. Well, it wasn't very good last year, and they lost to Ohio. So that's true. I would say I like Rocco Beck, but I don't. I've I said it on last week's show. I think not a guy that's really set up for success when it comes to playmakers around. Him. Yeah. So I, I think I'm somewhere in the middle on Iowa State. What do you, What do you got, Drew? Who's going to suck that you that everyone else yeah. likes? You only have 15 know. teams to pick from. Well, actually 14 because we know K-State is going to be picked by DY since they're not playing the Big 12 <laughs> title game. I don't think that they're getting like a ton of hype about like being a sleeper team, but like I just think that West Virginia is going to suck and probably might not make a bowl game. Like their, their schedule is tough. That was, you, my, you, that was mine. Yeah. They play Penn State in the non-con, then at Pitt in the non-con, and then they also play KU, Oklahoma State, Iowa State, K-State, Arizona, and UCF. Like that, that, They're probably not making a bowl game. And that Neil Browning that was my, kind of for all those reasons, at the end of the year. For yeah. all those reasons, that was mine. Like They have like a probably the most complicated schedule of all the teams that might have the chance to finish in the top half of the league. And I think last year was a little bit of an anomaly yep. too. So I, I, I don't hard regression coming. I don't feel great about them winning another game outside of Albany and Cincinnati. <laughs> Those are the only two that I see that I'm like, yep, they're for sure winning that one. Yeah, they and even, and even Cincinnati's on the road. Well, I will say I didn't, you know, I didn't think that they would like Pitt is just pretty not good right now, I would say, as a program. So that could happen. But outside of that, it is tough. I mean, even the teams that come to Morgantown. It won't be the easiest. Baylor is probably the easiest home game they get uh, this season outside of their FCS opponent. Because other than that, it's K State and Iowa State and KU that are going there. So yeah, and, and I'm on board. With might that. be broken by and their spirits might be broken by that point. So the, yeah. the, they could lose to Baylor. And that Neil Brown extension, it, you know, you look at it and you go, well, it's just one extra year that they added on. Neil Brown is under contract for three more years after this season. So it does seem silly that they would have just tacked on a little extra there. Now, I don't know the details. Maybe it didn't up his pay or anything, and it's just kind of for show. But either way, it's not great PR because you gave an extension to a guy that, you know, four of the five years suggests that he's just not going to be very good this season. So I'm in the same boat with you guys on West Virginia. Last year was fraudulent. Uh, this year, they're going to get a, a dose of reality. So D.Y., Two teams off the board that we think will suck that everybody else likes. So uh, maybe a little tougher for you. It's a lot tougher because West Virginia was my pick. So I've been like scheming here as you guys talk. I'm glad you gave me some time to recalibrate. You had to bring up a map to see which teams were in the Big 12 this season. I did. And I put them in alphabetical order too, right? So I make sure I'm not missing anyone or putting someone twice because there's 16 teams. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, new age. You know, <coughs> excuse me. I think most people might, with the two that are off, might go with like a UCF or an Oklahoma State, but I kind of like those two. So I'm not going, I don't want to go there. And I don't think people think Colorado is that good. So <laughs> I think that's like cheating if I pick them. I don't know. You could say that they're just going to be even worse than they were last year. Yeah, yeah, which, you could just which, say that they're not going to win a game. It, which is, uh, I don't know if I go that far. But, like, they could be even worse than last year. wouldn't surprise me. I came across two choices, and I'm trying to determine which way I want to go. I'm probably uh, – yeah. Real quick, honorable mention uh, for me, since DY is not going to pick him because he loves him. UCF also would have been a contender on this on this <laughs> list for me here. I'm I'm not buying the UCF love that everybody else is. And if you watch the show from Friday, you know that I'm not as big of a KJ Jefferson guy as uh, everybody tries to act like. So, my I'll, I'll just say who my honorable mention is, and then I'll do my pick because I came down to two. My honorable mention would be Kansas because okay. you can't guarantee that Jalen Daniels is going to be healthy. Hater, of course. You're not DY you're, fighting with KU fans. You don't have a, they don't have a stadium they're playing in this year, so there's really no home field advantage at all, at all, which I would imagine makes games a little bit different for them, right? Um, the, a different routine. It's kind of out of whack a little bit. I don't know what their schedule looks like, but uh, does anyone think that the offense is going to be just humming 
without Andy Kotelnicki, an offensive coordinator. Yeah, that's a big concern. Yeah, that's a so, big concern. So I think KU is, you know, you could enter KU and give a pretty good argument. That's why I had them as an honorable mention. I'll go Arizona because I thought about Arizona. They have a lot of good players that chose to return, but there's two things working against them is that there's not a lot of continuity in what the system is going to be. Like those guys became good in a separate system. Are they still going to be as good as they were in a different system with the coaching staff that doesn't know them as well? And not that that's, this new coaching staff can't be good. They can, but – the players and the coaches are now in a league with a bunch of teams that they've never played before. So there's no familiarity with your opponent. And I think that matters. You see a lot of teams when they flip leagues, sometimes there is an adjustment period. So I think that's on the table as well. And then three, like, again, this, this, this coaching staff can be good at Arizona, but like, I don't know that they set the world on fire at San Jose state. I, I, I don't, I don't hate that one. That's, that's a good call. I think, Honestly, the the KU and Arizona situations probably come down to a lot of the same thing where, you know, personnel has stayed relatively the same at both. But with Arizona, you lose your head coach that obviously was a big key in why you were good last year. And at KU, you lose an offensive coordinator that was obviously really good because he got the job at Penn State and was probably a big key to what took place. So I think I think both of those are fair to throw out there. What I will say, this is a couple of scheduling things. So you bring up like KU schedule. The road game at Illinois being week two will be interesting because I I don't think Illinois, they're nowhere near as good as they were, you know, 2022. They're probably not in the best of shape to be better than they were even last year. And they ended up, I think, five and seven, six and six. But it will at least be a tricky enough game on the road early in the year to try and have to find your way through. Uh, and then they're going to face UNLV uh, as their third non-conference game, which could be a little bit dicey. But by the time I think they get to Big 12 play, like I wouldn't be overwhelmed by really a ton of these games that they have. Their, their three toughest games are going to come in a four-week stretch in the season at K-State, Iowa State, at home, at BYU. I think those are probably their, their three toughest because I think – and Houston's right before the K State game, so if you want to say their four toughest all come in a row, I'd buy that as well. Iowa State, uh, if they if they are loyal to their Sandals Kansas City Paradise thing that they like, <laughs> they will pack Arrowhead Stadium, right? Oh, that's I true. You would think it's true. Good point. <laughs> Uh, all right. Should we, in let, terms, should we let Dy go first for uh, who's yeah the, yeah uh, he can go here team that he, yeah that way nobody steals your your thunder here. So team that you think will be better uh, than what the masses are saying. Okay. Um, I, I like two. Well, maybe we should have let him go, go last oh. here. So he had time to think. I like two here. Um, and I'll say my honorable mention one after you guys go. So I'm not like <laughs> taking another one from you. I will say Houston. Ooh. Uh, Willie Fritz. Okay. He wins. It's a good Fritz, one. He wins. It's a good one. Uh, I thought about Houston. <laughs> For mine as well, uh, so that's that's a solid one, man. This is tough because I I, think I was kind of realizing this the other day when we were discussing it. I think a lot of these teams, it, I think there's a pretty defined like midpoint, and we talked about it with the quarterbacks. Like we kind of know the top half and the bottom half. There's a good gap in between there. I think it's kind of the same thing here, where I look around and I say, yeah, I think they're going to be terrible. I think they're going to be terrible. Like I just don't have a ton of faith and, there. Yeah. There's a couple – you might have to pick someone that you've absolutely trashed before. <laughs> yeah, no, there's no doubt about that. There is absolutely no like, doubt I'm about gonna, that. I'm like, I'm going to laugh if you pick Baylor because if you're Dave Aranda's <laughs> – No, I will not pick Baylor. I, well, we did talk about the quarterback situation yeah. there. That is intriguing. Uh, but as a man of principle of hating Dave Aranda, I will not say that. Um, I'm just going to take a shot in the dark because there is good momentum there now. How much of the talent can be infused quickly? I don't know. And they're going to be relying on some spotty quarterback play uh, after they lost you know, their supreme talent uh, last year. 
I'm going to go with Arizona State, though. I'm going to throw Arizona State out there because I think – I can't. <laughs> no shot. No, I, I know. Shot. I know. Look, they I hate might it. Not win it. They're not going to win a Big 12 game. Actually, I rescind it because I just looked at their schedule. Do you realize that they have to have the toughest schedule in the Big 12 this season? Them or West that's fine. That, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this that, is, that's why I wasn't touching that within like a and, five and foot pole. And, and they are a disaster because they they haven't been able to like recruit well because they have all these scholarship reductions because of yeah. Tom Edwards. They're they're doing like they're I think twenty twenty five class they're off to a good start and they're doing some things. But yeah, this, I just this it seems like a Gabe R I P. No, this is this has Arizona nothing State to do with pack. him because I I throw the water on his fire all the time with Arizona State. <laughs> Uh, but it's it has more to do with the fact that I think, like DUI said, all these other coaches I've talked immense crap on because uh, I think they're just not very good. So does does Arizona State win that Thursday night game at Texas State September twelfth? Because if they don't, they, they could go zero and three game. in the non con. Like <laughs> they this might is not winning. I even they knew when I said it before looking at the schedule that this was a boom or bust pick <laughs> because they could go zero and three against Wyoming, Mississippi State, and Texas State. But their Big Twelve schedule. At Texas Tech, KU, Utah, at Cincinnati, they could win that one. At Oklahoma State, UCF, at K State, BYU, at Arizona. That is just unimaginably hard for them. So, Owen, Owen 12 is more likely than them being better than what people think. <laughs> Owen 12 is definitely on the table. Yeah, I think, yeah. But Owen, but me, we're just bullied based on it. No, it's, it's fine. I Look, I thought maybe the schedule would be a little bit lighter there. And if we're playing it's the not. game of like, adjusted wins uh no it's not so i rescind my arizona state pick uh i just i i was trying to find a, a coach that hasn't been around long enough for me to hate so i guess if i have to give a serious one uh and kind of eat some crow i will not touch a baylor i promise i'll go tcu maybe they get things back on track there but like i don't love the quarterback like i this is that would just totally be banking on the head coach too. But like we were talking fraud watch coming in the near future. Sonny Dykes is squarely on the fraud watch board. He, he, so he, he's talking crap on the one he picked already. It's, he picked I, it, then he trashed his own. That's, this is why this is why Houston is the best team available here. I because think there's they have one. a good coach. I think they have a serviceable one. quarterback. If like, there's another one. There's maybe a second one, and you didn't see. Pick and that I think involves you guys liking guys more than what I like. So <laughs> probably, I, but there's an obvious one. I'll just take TCU and get bullied by everybody about this one. It's okay. I, I knew that I had bad picks because, again, I am a man that I stick to my guns. I hate half these teams in the league. Why am I going to pick them? So there you go. Drew, who you got? Uh, mine is Texas Tech. All right. If you look at the schedule, theirs is actually pretty nav- navigable. Like they, they only play one road game before the month of October. I, yeah. That wasn't going to be my honorable mention pick. But it would have been like my second honorable mention pick. I don't really believe in Joey McGuire as a coach yet. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I think there's a lot of more seeing I have to do before I believe. But they have recruited a roster that might be the second or third most talented in the yeah. Big 12. And the, the schedule is pretty light. It's Abilene Christian, the non-conference, at Washington State home against North Texas, home against Arizona State, home against Cincinnati. I mean that's that's their first five games. That they could be they five could and oh. Yeah. They could be five and oh going to the going to Arizona and then you lose that maybe five and one and then you host Baylor and then at TCU. Like this they, is, they could start they could start six and two, seven and one. This is quite the turn of events for Texas Tech considering how they decided to schedule last season. Yeah, you know, last the road year, game like, at Wyoming and then Oregon. Last year, they, they basically when they like composed last year's schedule, they just like got in a room and was like, how hard can we make this? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of wild the way that things played out for them. Like uh, the, their, their winnable games are home against West Virginia, home against Colorado – Home against Baylor, home against Cincinnati, home against Arizona State, home against North Texas, at Washington State, home against Abilene Christian. Like that, yeah. that's Here, seven, eight wins. Here's why I didn't pick Texas Tech. And I know that maybe I threw Is Baron Morton slightly under the bus last year, but I don't like, I don't, I think expectations are probably right for them again. Uh, I would assume that people probably have them closer to seven. I would probably have them closer to eight wins as like kind of the bar for the season. But they were really close to it last year. Like they had unfortunate 
losses to start the year, but they lost by a combined 10 points their first two games. They lost by a touchdown at West Virginia. And then from there on, they were pretty much what you would have wanted out of the season, essentially. I mean, they they had the bad loss to K-State. Avery ran all over them, and then they lost to BYU. But they reset it, and they beat TCU. They won at KU. They beat UCF. They did get embarrassed by Texas, and then they beat Cal uh, by 20 in their bowl game. So I, they're, they're on pace there. And like D.Y. said, the talent they've acquired – Joey McGuire, he may not be the best coach, but he's the best talent acquisition guy in the league, and he's setting them up along with UCF to maybe have the most blue-chip type of players over the next handful of years in the Big 12, and it may not even be close with some of the other teams the way that things are operating. So uh, Texas Tech is a good one. I just, in my mind, I I'm, I don't put them in that realm, so. I'm looking at uh, win totals right now. Texas Tech is seven and a half. And the one that's really jumping out to me is like, this is this might be uh, free. Uh, Arizona State is four and a half. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if I see five wins on that schedule. I don't know. Odds, sure makers, I, odds makers see what I see. They see, a, <laughs> they see a young coach they haven't spoiled on yet like all the others out there. So, but Jeff Sims at quarterback. You know, my first honorable mention was, and it's probably Mason's going to have a similar answer to why he didn't, as it, what he just did for Texas Tech is Oklahoma State. I think people look at them and say, Alan Bowman, you're going to win six or seven games. If they went 10, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. probably fair. I, uh, I, we're going to wind things down here. I've, I've yeah. now reached the stage of, uh, being a dad where my daughter is sticking her foot in her mouth. So that's not great. She's just laying here, just back and forth toe going into her mouth. So uh, she's not crying anymore. So that's at least a win. I guess if that'll uh, do things for us, here's, here's what I have an idea for us now. Uh, sometime this week, because it's off season, no better time to kind of kill time. Another thing that we'll have to keep track of uh, the, f well, maybe let's see. Is, is fan done teaching yet? Is he done with his you know real teaching, job yeah. to where we can bother him during the day? Uh, because maybe we just need to get the four of us together, and the four of us will draft Big 12 teams that we'll kind of have stock in this coming year, and we'll come up with a point system. And so the team that you draft, you have them through the year, we'll keep track throughout the year. Like each win, each you know, accomplishment is worth something, and at the end, we'll see who has the most points. I think that's what we need to do. Uh, based on like the, the better and worse than what people think. I think that'd be kind of fun to see. Uh, and then that way, you know, people out there, they have a dog in the fight uh, when Arizona State is on playing <laughs> Texas State or Wyoming. Also, come on, find an FCS team, Arizona State. <laughs> what FCS the hell? Team. So that's, that's bad scheduling on them. Uh, the award for worst scheduling decision in the Big 12 this coming year, though, it goes to Colorado for having North Dakota State come to Boulder. Uh, and that's just when you're a bad team, that's not a good move. Yeah. And they still play Nebraska. Yes. They're yeah. at Nebraska. And they get, and at Colorado State. And at Colorado yeah. State. Like yeah. Yeah, they could go in three. Yeah. That, that's, uh, yeah. that's another team that they might have. Overall, they have the argument for the toughest schedule in the Big 12 because you play, obviously, North Dakota State at Nebraska at Colorado State, at UCF, K-State, at Arizona, at Texas Tech, Utah, at KU, Oklahoma State. Uh, I didn't mention uh, Cincinnati in there because I think Cincinnati will suck. Hey, I'm repping Cincinnati today. Oh, hey, how about it? There you go. Go Bearcats. Drew's wearing his <laughs> ugly shirt. Okay, and uh, D.Y. is going to Arkansas. So he's, you know. Cold yeah. hugs. <laughs> I've got an old Mavs shirt on, so we're we're you know waiting to see how the Mavs doing game four tonight. So uh, yeah, Colorado they get the worst schedule award for the upcoming season. So they're the gift that keeps on giving. You can find just so many different ways to make fun of them. But uh, we'll wrap it up now. We've been going for about an hour. Pretty good show on a Monday for everybody. A lot of things talked about. We will be back again tomorrow. Dive a little bit more into K State football and basketball for you. If you want updates on everything else going on with K-State, head over to kstateonline.com. Find us at On3. Good recruiting updates over there, transfer portal and high school recruiting, and uh, everything in between that involves the Cats. So for Drew Galloway, Derek Young, I'm Mason Voth. Thanks for watching K-State Online.